opening the door wide to new possibilities, hope of real breakthroughs and understanding more big ideas than we could have ever These imagined. These are the biggest grants we've ever been able to We are going to come out of this with some breakthrough ideas. Focused solely on your endocrine tumors. You are not alone. We are all with you on the So we'll begin the afternoon session now with a multidisciplinary tumor board. We'll be discussing some real life type situations um, where decisions have to be made about patient management. And I think not only will it demonstrate to everybody how important it is to have people from different specialties all sitting together and talking together, but also will emphasize a lot of the important points that were briefly mentioned in the earlier talks but weren't able to be elaborated upon. After this session, we're going to have questions from the audience, and anybody who has questions, continue to write them on cards and pass them forward, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly could. Okay, so first patient. 29-year-old female felt shaky and anxious. Symptoms were relieved by eating. The symptoms worsened to the point that every hour, day and night, she had to awake from sleep in order to eat. She measured her own blood sugar, actually, and it was 32. It's exceedingly low. And she had an insulin level that was very high at that time. An MRI showed multiple bilateral liver metastases and a pancreatic mass. So the first question is, what is the diagnosis, and do we need any other additional tests to prove the diagnosis? Why don't we start with Dr. Metz? Um, okay, so uh, the diagnosis is probably going to be an insulinoma that is metastatic. It's a very, very unusual presentation, this. Um, most insulinomas are benign. Most insulinomas are found early when there's a small lesion in the pancreas. So the fact that this patient uh, presented with widespread metastatic disease, which occurs up to 15% of the time and they're malignant, uh, is surprising to me that it took that long. So I don't know if she'd been eating all, you know, every hour for the last five years or if this has just been going on for a few months. Although it should be worth noting that some insulinomas produce primarily pro-insulin and often present with metastatic disease in higher volume at the time they are. No, I, I agree. I'm saying this is not a classic presentation, but I think it probably is an insulinoma, and I would want some tissue. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I wouldn't actually get, in this particular case, uh, a nuclear scan. I would want a biopsy. And I think the point, point to make is that nuclear scans, if they're going to be negative any neuro, in any neuroendocrine tumors, it would be an insulinoma that's more likely going to be negative. Okay, so Dr. Yang, would you do any additional tests at this point? I, mean, I agree that uh, the diagnosis is most likely an insulom insulinoma with uh, metastases, although a um, rare, rare presentation. She's 29 years old. She, she wouldn't have pancreatic adenocarcinoma with liver mets. So um, I agree, though, that uh, a tissue, bi tissue diagnosis um, to start her management is probably the easiest way to go with avoiding a scan. And how would you get the tissue? Uh, we'd recommend uh, the direct approach. We'd do an endoscopic ultrasound with uh, fine needle aspiration of the pancreatic mass or of the liver lesion. She has a pancreatic, pancreatic mass. mass. So Dr. Warner, what would you do about controlling the symptoms while additional diagnostic tests are being done? We would have to uh, continue the patient on uh, gluc we'd like to continue the patient on uh, uh, infusions with um, glucose in order to maintain the blood sugar level if, if it's that precarious. And uh, we would also consider, uh, um, I would consider some additional diagnostic uh, tests to be done too. I would like to do a panel of markers because uh, sometimes these tumors are multiple functional so that there would be other um, markers that might be abnormal. Okay. Would you use a somatostatin analog? No, I would not uh, for several reasons. That can be a double-edged sword because uh, 
it may also suppress glucagon production and uh, worsen the hypoglycemia. Uh, you, you can't tell until you try it, but I don't believe I would th consider that a, an important um, and safe modality of treatment in this situation. So Dr. Reedy, the uh, diagnosis comes back, a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor consistent with an insulinoma. How would you begin treatment? And where is the mass in the pancreas? In the lots, of we, lots of liver lots, metastasis. Lots of liver metastasis, right. So when a patient has a hormone secreting tumor, um, we unquestionably want to start therapy as soon as possible. When it's insulin secreting, you want to start at stat because low sugars are life-threatening. Um, so this is the type of patient that often we will admit. Um, and it depends on the distribution of the disease. So liver-directed therapy, for example, um, if it's you know, a, a lot of liver disease, such as embolization, will quickly um, fix that. In fact, I've had patients that um, we've admitted, um, we embolize, and then they're on insulin drips because their, their glucagon is, you know, it, they get um, such dramatic results that then their sugars go up to 500, and it's absolutely amazing to see. Um, but you want to treat this sooner rather than later. Um, surgical debulking, um, which John may talk about, it sounds like probably not an option here. But this is one where you want to make sure that whatever therapy you're giving, it's going to work fast. And everolimus as a systemic therapy is Correct. often an excellent choice up front because it's uniquely effective in insulinomas as well as being effective in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And you not only can normalize blood sugar pretty quickly in many cases, Dr. Akulke reported uh, from Boston, but also you can get tumor shrinkage in many cases that um, are surprising. So I think all of those are good. Dr. Cinnamon, uh, do you have any other thoughts about uh, embolization of people that are quite sick from secretory hormonal th uh, tumors? So for those, um, I'm an interventional radiologist, so when it comes to medical management, you've got the experts here. Uh, when it comes to intervention, I think I could tell you some things and uh, relieve your anxiety of the interventional procedure. It's a relatively um, straightforward procedure going through the blood vessels, and uh, I don't know if any of you have had any, but it's, it's not uh, very painful at all, uh, the, angi the angiogram and the embolization, and we are pretty good at uh, selecting out the vessels that go to the tumor. In patients that have larger uh, tumors that uh, are occupying uh, more of the liver, we may do more diffuse um, embolizations, but if there is a uh, more single uh, localizing lesion, we can actually get directly into the blood vessel that's going to the lesion and just um, uh, treat the lesion itself. We could do either a bland embolization, which means um, just uh, particles and destroy the blood supply uh, to the tumor. By destroying the blood supply to the tumor, it um, kills it, just like if you take the blood supply away from your finger, your finger would um, uh, get necrotic. Um, what I often tell patients, it's like uh, turning a grape into a raisin, um, a dried or a dried out plum into to a prune, and it basically kills and destroys the tumor and takes away the uh, activity of the tumor. Um, and that's what we do. That's one of the types of procedures that we do tell patients from neuroendocrine tumors. Okay, and um, soon I hope we'll be participating in a multi-institutional trial comparing bland embolization, chemoembolization, um, to try to figure out what is the best way to treat these sort of tumors in conjunction with the group at University of Pennsylvania. And I think that it's, it's a very exciting uh, prospect that we will finally have a clearer answer about this. Radioembolization is becoming a, a bit less popular these days because there seems to be an increased risk of liver injury when people have PRRT. And since PRRT is now the up and coming therapy, we have to be a little careful with that modality. Just one comment about that is that in radioembolization, if you do a whole liver, there is significant damage. But if you do a, a, a segment of the liver and um, segmentectomy, then the radiation does not affect the entire liver and just affects that segment, and then it would be safer than the bad data is when you treat the entire liver. Correct. Okay. So how would you make decisions about when to use other modalities, like sunitinib 
or peptide receptor radiotherapy? In this patient? Yeah. So uh, one thing that we haven't touched on is whether this patient has underlying MEN1 or not. Uh, so about a third of insulinomas plus have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, and she's young, so it's a possibility. Although, uh, again, those are usually benign in MEN patients. Of course, MEN patients can get multiple primaries, and so we don't really know that these metastases are all insulin producing, and there may be a PPOMA in, in the pancreas and a gastronome in the duodenum and an insulinoma somewhere else, so you need to think about that as a possibility. I, in these patients, would potentially consider a systemic therapy. I think PRRT is a great possibility, assuming that the patient has uptake. Uh, and so you'd have to get a, uh, a, in, currently in our place, an Octria scan, or in the future, hopefully, soon, a gallium scan. Uh, and if there's decent uptake, I think a PRRT in this setting would probably be very useful. I am very much in favor of using Everolimus in this particular type of patient because it does two things. It both improves glucose control and it is a good anti-tumor therapy. Uh, but this is a great uh, tumor board discussion and we would want to see these x-rays and we'd want to have the radiologist sitting there and saying, well, I can get into that vessel, but I can't get into that vessel, etc." So I think this is a tumor board case because there are many ways to skin the cat. Correct. And we do have um, less data than we would have at a normal medical tumor board because of the nature of the uh, discussion today, but clearly physicians would want to have all the x-rays and all the pathology and everything laid out before them. So what is the role of surgery for metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in the liver? Dr. McAuliffe. McAuliffe. I would say that it is uh, limited. You first, again, like you had mentioned, um, have to have excellent cross-sectional imaging and a full um, understanding of the burden of disease, not only in the liver, but other places, um, just in general for neuroendocrine tumors. Um, if a patient is not able to be managed with um, other therapies in the metastatic setting, um, a symptomatic control can be achieved at some, in some cases with surgical removal of these tumors pending they can be removed safely with adequate liver function after the operation, just in general. Okay, we talked about embolization. And uh, any other questions or comments from anybody in the audience before we talk about the next case? There's an older treatment that used to be used with considerable effectiveness in this situation, which has to be borne in mind if you have no other options, and that is the use of streptozotocin, mm -hmm. which is still available and is rather effective against uh, insulin-producing cells. Right. An excellent point. That's really an excellent drug for insulinomas. It's used much less these days than it was in the past, but it has not only a high response rate, as we talked about in our discussions earlier, but in addition, is um, particularly effective in insulinomas. One of the reasons why we don't use it as much as we used to is the potential of that drug for impairing kidney function. And it makes it more difficult for people to then go on to have treatments like PRRT. So nowadays, we tend to use things like temozolomide and capecitabine more frequently. But certainly, if somebody is resistant to that or in insulinomas, there is certainly the consideration of streptozosin. Very good point. OK. And for the doctors here, this is what the pathology looks like, positive staining for chromogranin and positive staining for insulin, making the diagnosis even more obvious. OK, patient number two. A 54-year-old male presented with bouts of severe watery diarrhea and intense flushing, which occurred several times per week. These episodes had increased in frequency up to many times per day over a six-year period. An MRI demonstrated multiple masses throughout both lobes of the liver, with the largest mass in the right lobe 11.7 centimeters in diameter, the largest mass in the left lobe was 6.5 centimeters, and there was mild thickening in the terminal ileum. So what is the most likely diagnosis, and what are the procedures to make that diagnosis? Who would like to start? We give Dr. Yang a chance. 
Um, sounds like from the imaging that the, uh, this is a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor case again, and looks like the primary is coming from the ilium, uh, which is the most common place in the small intestine. Uh, if it's in the terminal ileum, the diagnosis can be made through uh, routine colonoscopy with uh, ileoscopy. So you just pop into the terminal ileum, and uh, within a couple of centimeters, you can reach the lesion, make a bi uh, take a diagnosis by uh, biopsy, and uh, start the management that way. Okay. If that were negative, what next? When do you do double balloon push enteroscopy? Well, if that's negative, uh, then you have to scan really uh, the entire GI tract. Um, because most of the lesions come from either the foregut, hindgut, or midgut, uh, if you do the colonoscopy, the rectum's clean, the colon's clean, the ileum is clean, then you can concentrate on the other parts of the GI tract. The upper GI tract is easy. You can do a routine endoscopy. Uh, that will go and look inside the stomach, the duodenum. Uh, but once you get, if that's negative, then you get into a little bit of a quandary because then the small intestine deeper down is more difficult to access through routine endoscopy. So there's two choices. One, which we always try to go first for, is the non-invasive route. That's through capsule endoscopy, uh, which is also known as pill camera. It's the size of a quarter maybe, and uh, patients swallow it. It's an outpatient procedure and it takes uh, millions of pictures of your, deep into your small intestine, so your jejunum and the ileum, which may be higher up and not accessible through colonoscopy. Uh, it's an eight hour video test, and uh, what the gastroenterologist does is after the video, we review it and we, we're just looking for the tumor. If there is a tumor or something suggestive of a tumor, then you have to go further for a tissue diagnosis because the capsule endoscopy only takes pictures. It doesn't allow you to take biopsies. So then the next step would be uh, a deep enteroscopy, which I'll be talking about later. Um, so depending on where the lesion is, whether it's closer to a proximal small, small bowel or in the distal small bowel, we can do deep enteroscopy through the oral route or the rectal route to reach this area, biopsy it, and more importantly, mark it with a tattoo so that if this is just an isolated lesion in the small bowel, you can mark it so that when they go for a surgery, it's easier to identify. And so the surgeon won't be struggling looking for this tiny little lesion. Okay, thank you. So this patient clearly needs some additional diagnostic procedures. So the question is, in this kind of a case, where do you get the most information? A triple-phased CT scan? an MRI scan with uh, EUVIS contrast and diffusion imaging and all that you can do with uh, MRI? And should the patient have either CT enterography or MR enterography to further uh, look for a primary at the same time? Or uh, what are your feelings, Dr. Cinnamon? It's hard to predict which is going to be the most. Which is, it's hard to predict which is going to give you the best information. Um, and I think that uh, in this case, I would leave it to my imagers, and once the diagnosis is made, then I'll attack the liver mets and uh, treat them. But I, I'm not sure which is the best of the techniques that you mentioned. Maybe somebody else okay. can. Yeah, uh, Diane, what would you say? So um, I think point well taken that you know, triple phase CT or MRI are probably sufficient. The point being that it shouldn't just be a regular CT with contrast, and it should definitely not be a regular CT without contrast, because you'll miss the disease. So it has to be either triple phase or MRI. We actually don't go kind of on these push double balloon enteroscopies and things like that because nowadays with good quality cross-sectional imaging, um, in a patient with a functional neuroendocrine tumor, I mean, this one has thickening in the terminal ileum. Even if it's not there, it's there, right? We missed it. But um, we are pretty comfortable now with imaging that when you have mesenteric lymph nodes in certain places, we know it's in the small bowel. So, you know, like just the presentation of the scan can be very helpful. Um, so I don't feel strongly that uh, we have to put our patients through these very invasive procedures of push endoscopies and double endoscopies in the setting of metastatic disease um, because I don't know if it's necessarily going to change my management, especially when a functional tumor like this. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I would actually handle this differently. Um, You've got an 11-centimeter mass in one lobe and a 6-centimeter mass in the other lobe. 
I would put a needle into the liver and get a core as opposed to an FNA so I can then grade it. I would definitely get an MRI of that liver because I want to know how debulkable that is. And if uh, I'm thinking ahead that this particular patient is going to hopefully get wide debulking surgery with removal of the primary, which is almost certainly in the small bowel. And so I would want a functional imaging study as well because this could very well have been escaped the abdomen and be in bones and lungs and other places as well. But I'm thinking ahead in this patient would be a biopsy in a grade, an MRI of the liver to know how amenable it is to some surgery, and a somatostatin analog for maintenance right now, and potentially uh, debulking surgery unless it's way, you know, spread beyond the abdomen. Right. I'm actually in agreement with Dr. Metz the way I would approach this. I think the two most important diagnostic studies would be a gallium 68 um, PET CT, which would CT the whole body and give you functional imaging at the same time, and get a really good MRI of the liver, which in our institution we would do with EOVIST to uh, try to optimize the resolution of the liver metastases, see where they are in terms of segments, and see how many small things there are you don't know about, and then you can plan treatment further. Clearly, this patient needs some metastatin analogs, um, as Dr. Reedy pointed out, and just be aware that within months, we're hoping we will have telotrostat in our armamentarium, and if people still have diarrhea and flushing on somatostatin analogs, we can use this additional medication to stop the terrible symptoms. How, how critical is it to determine the primary in these cases? Well, I think that uh, there are cases we never find the primary and we make do. I think that this is almost certainly a mid-gut primary. It's exceedingly unlikely that this would be an occult pancreatic primary that doesn't show up on MRI or CT or uh, gallium-68 imaging. That would be exceedingly unlikely. Um, and certainly, if the EUS was done, it would make it even more exceedingly unlikely. Carcinoid syndrome almost never comes from pancreatic primaries. It's almost always from tumors of the gut, particularly the mid-gut. So I don't, I, I think that's really where the money is. In rare cases, you can get primaries that make carcinoid syndrome, as we've heard, from lung, from ovary, from other places. But those are very, very rare. Almost all of them are mid-gut tumors. And would you recommend uh, um, debulking surgery as opposed to uh, embolization as your first procedure in this? Uh, I think it's going to depend so much on the results of the imaging. I mean, my view is that if we had primarily a couple of big masses that was amenable to an anatomic resection, or you can get rid of those, that giant mass in the right and a giant mass in the left, and then the somatostatin analog maintenance or um, embolization of the liver can be done to control the remaining low volume disease. That might be a very reasonable thing to do. It'd be particularly um, a good idea. And you take out a gallbladder at the same time and you do the things that Dr. Um, McAuliffe talked about earlier at surgery. But um, I think we really have to see the imaging. Uh, Dr. McAuliffe, do you have any other thoughts uh, about when you take out big old masses like that? No, I, 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 like I said in my lecture, it's, uh, you, know, I, you know, surgeons can take out many things, but it's putting things back together and uh, allowing enough of the organs uh, left over to be able to keep up with the, you know, functions important for life. And with the bi large bilobar tumors or a, a tumor on each side of the liver that's that big, um, I would be surprised if that, if that person would be amenable to a debulking procedure that was safe. That being said, you'd absolutely need an MRI or a high quality CAT scan to fully evaluate that. What we would typically do with the liver um, lesions is do one at a time, one side at a time. We would um, try to embolize, let's say, the larger tumor on the right and uh, then evaluate how the tumor reacted to that and, if there, and how the liver uh, reacted, how much liver function is remaining on the right. And if it looks like it's okay, then we would go for the left a few weeks later after the patient recovered from the original hit of the uh, angiogram and embolization. And we do it in stages. And we have no problems coming back uh, several times if needed to uh, try to debulk it as opposed to a big open surgery. Okay, well, let's just say for argument's sake that the two big tumors were able to be taken out. The remaining tumors were all very tiny, maybe not more than a centimeter in size. 
patient was put on a somatostatin analog and was stable for a few years and then started growing primarily in the liver. But um, the question is, at what point do you do PRRT for the next therapy, and at what point do you embolize the liver? What, what do you people think? What do you say, Diane? Nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, that's the art. That's yes. the bottom line. But what, what would people do in real life I, when you're faced with a patient right in front of you? I would like to interject that at no time has it been mentioned that one could do markers, blood and urine, you're just presum presuming that this is carcinoid. I'm presuming it's a carcinoid, correct. But uh, it's very simple the first time you see the patient to do a fasting blood for serotonin, chromogranin A, and pancreastatin. The latter, which is not being used enough, in my opinion, is very helpful for prognostic purposes. Also, once you've drawn those bloods, you, you can, and perhaps collect the urine or do a plasma 5-HIA, you've confirmed the diagnosis, and the, then uh, the tissue diagnosis is less imperative, although um, some surgeons feel that uh, they can almost always find the primary even when it's tiny, and that's been my experience, and there is a school of thought that proclaims that uh, survival, even in the presence of metastases, is better if you remove the primary. I'd like to hear what our surgical colleague feels in that regard. Firstly, as far as finding a small um, GI-related neuronal tumor, yes, typically make a small incision in, a, in, a, in the operating room and pull the bowel out, and using your hands, you can actually feel uh, sub-centimeter areas um, that can be removed effectively. Um, that size of tumor is not necessarily picked up even with the best cross-sectional imaging, be it MRI or CT scan, so you can actually put your hands on it and, and, and be able to feel it. Um, Removing the primary in the context of metastatic disease, um, I am not um, knowledgeable of evidence to suggest that that's beneficial in this disease uh, for patients, um, but I'm sure there is um, some surgeons in the world that would disagree one way or the other regarding that. Thank you, and just one other point to throw out is that I think anybody with a carcinoid syndrome, high serotonin and uh, urinary 5-HIA, as Dr. Warner uh, pointed out, should have a baseline echocardiogram to rule out carcinoid heart disease and also as a comparison with echocardiograms to be done in the future. You really don't want to miss carcinoid heart disease, and we see it missed under the noses of doctors actually all too frequently. Okay, any other comments from the panel before we Include this the management case. Of, the, of a case like this is not do one thing first, then do another thing second. You do a number of items Correct. concurrently because Correct. it, and it requires the input of multiple specialists. We need the, the radiologist, we need uh, perhaps uh, the surgeon, we need the oncologist, and uh, we need the laboratory tests all to be done and as soon as you can establish the diagnosis, uh, if it's only by the markers, you can start uh, uh, somatostatin analog treatment, which will give, most of the time, will give quick relief. Thank you. So I think that in order to get to the questions of the audience and still stay on time, we're gonna stop after uh, these two cases, one pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, one intestinal carcinoid type tumor. All the people on the panel who are able to stay, please continue. <laughs>